Okay, guys, we're going to take a look at uh, chapter two. So we're going to start talking about chapter two and section 2.1 is all about functions and the basics of functions and what is a function and how do we know when a function is when we see it. Uh, so there's a lot of information in this chapter. Make sure you download the PowerPoint uh, and click through it and write down examples as we go. Let's take a look. So we start off with a few definitions. First off is a relation. So if you hear the word relation mentioned in math, we're talking about basically any set of ordered pairs. Um, it may be, uh, they may be given to you in a table. They may be given to you as an X, Y. They may be given in a graph. But any set of ordered pairs that relate an X, an input, and an output, that's a relation. The first component of all of, of any relation that we look at Usually you think of those as your x values, but it doesn't necessarily have to be x. Whatever your input is is called your domain. The second components, whatever that is, uh, usually we call those the y values, but it doesn't have to be called the y values as long as it's the output. That would be a range. Let's do a short example here. So it says the dom it asks us to find the domain and range of the relation, so we're looking at a list of ordered pairs. Uh, I don't know what this represents. It looks like maybe the first components are years, but I'm not really sure. They didn't give us the context. But what I want you to think about is how would you represent your domain? So remember the domain are the first components, or so your x values. So that would be the set 1994, 1995, 1996, 1997, and 1998. And then how about the range? So the range are your second components, or your y values. And so that would be the set 56.21, 51, and so forth. No, make sure you see that those are both written in set notation with the brackets. OK, when does a relation become a function? Usually in math, we work with functions. And so what makes something a function? So a relation is a function. This is sort of the formal definition. It becomes a function if the correspondence between two sets, x and y, that assigns to each element of x exactly one element of y. And that sounds really formal, so let's, let's break that down a little bit. What I want you to think about here is as long as each input value only assigns or maps to one output value, then we're OK for a function. So take a look at this example. We've got the number 1, the input of 1 maps to the output of 6, input of 2 maps to the output of 6, input of 3 maps to the output of 8, and input of 4 also maps to the output of 9. So think about, based on what we just talked about, does every input map to only one output? So the domain would be the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. The range, of course, would be the numbers 6, 8, and 9. It's tempting because you see the number 6 repeat to say, no, this isn't a function, right? But the, where is the 6? The 6 is in the range, not the domain. So think about what we said. 1 maps to 6 and only 6. 2 maps to 6 and only 6. Now, we already used the 6, but that's OK. 2 only has one output, so that's OK. 1 only has one output, so that's OK. And of course, 3 only has one output of 8, and 4 has one output of 9. So this would be a function, according to the definition. Now, compare that to this example. So we've got a different relation here, still dealing with four ordered pairs. Think about if this would be a function. So does every input map to only one output? So hopefully you see right away that the 6 maps to the number 1 and it also maps to the number 2. That's not a function, right? Every input can only go to one output. So this would violate the definition of a function because 6 has two outputs. So this would not be a function. If you're looking at a list of ordered pairs, a quick way to do this, of course, is just to look at the values in the domain. And if any of the domain values repeat, then it's not a function. We'll look at some more different ways to look at functions in a few minutes. Another way we talk about functions, or we see very often, is when we write functions in what's called function notation. So here's an example of function notation. We've got f of x is the name of the function, equals x squared plus 3x plus 5. So we want to be very clear here that this is not f 
times x. A lot of times students think this is multiplication. That is not what it means. It means the function named f evaluated at the input variable x. So f of x is the way we'd say that. It's defined according to this, this relation here. So they're asking us to evaluate f of 2. So what that means is replace the x, the input, with a 2 and see what you get. So wherever there's an x in the function expression, we're going to substitute a 2 and we're going to simplify it. So f of 2, if we replace all those, two, all those x's with a 2, 2 squared plus 3 times 2 plus 5, of course, make sure you follow order of operations, exponents first, then multiplication, then addition. We get a value of 15. So the ordered pair here that would correspond to this would be 2 comma 15. Next is the same function. They want us to evaluate f of x plus 3. So make sure you see what they're asking us to do here. Wherever we have x in the expression, we're going to replace it with x plus 3. So we've got x plus 3 quantity squared plus 3 times x plus 3 plus 5. Now we're not going to get a number as our answer like we did in the last example because we're not replacing x with a number like we were replacing it with 2 a few minutes ago. We're replacing it with another expression. So we're going to get an expression when we simplify this in terms of x. Be sure you see that the x plus 3 squared has to be foiled. Please don't make the mistake of just saying that's x squared plus 9. That's not right. You have to foil the x plus 3. So x plus 3 squared would give you x squared plus 6x plus 9. Distribute the 3 and then combine like terms. And we get the expression x squared plus 9x plus 23. Part C of this question, same function. They want us to replace all the x's with negative x. So similar to the last example, we're going to substitute wherever there's an x. We're going to substitute a negative x, and we're going to simplify it. Make sure you see that when you square a negative x, it becomes a positive x squared. The square is still there, but now it's going to be a positive x squared. 3 times negative x gives us negative 3x. And just like the last example, if we had like terms, we'd co combine them, but we don't. So this is as far as we can simplify this. Okay, this example, it says to determine whether the equation defines y as a function of x. So it's another way of writing a function, uh, just using x's and y's. f of x, by the way, in the last example we talked about is the function notation, but f of x can also be used interchangeably with y. So if you see f of x or y, uh, those can be used interchangeably. So in this example, instead of using f of x, they used y. So the best way to do this is to see if you can arrange, rearrange this equation and get the y by itself. So the easiest way to do this to get the y by itself would be, hopefully you see it, is to just subtract x squared from both sides, and we get 4 minus x squared on the right side. So we have y equals 4 minus x squared. And then what you want to do is you want to think about, if I were to substitute a value in place of the x, how many outputs would I get for y? Because remember, every input can only have one output to be a function. Any number will work. However, you do need to be a little careful. I would avoid 0 as a value for x. Uh, and any number that you substitute in that would give you a 0 for the y, I would try something else. In this example, I chose 1 as the value to substitute in for x. But any number will work. It doesn't matter as long as it's not 0 or something that makes the y a 0. So when I do this, I get 4 minus 1 squared, which of course is 4 minus 1, which just gives me 3. That's it. When x is 1, y is 3, I only get one output. So this would be a function. Now let's compare that to this example. It looks very similar, but there's one change. This time the y is squared. So same directions determine whether the equation y defines a function of x. So we've got x squared plus y squared equals 4. So I'm going to subtract the x squared from both sides. Now think about how you would get the y by itself here. Notice it's y squared, so to get the y by itself, we're going to have to take the square root of both sides. And if you remember back to chapter 1 when we solved equations using the square root method, whenever you take a square root, you have to remember to put the plus minus in front of it. So we've got y equals plus minus the square root of 4 minus x squared. A um, couple of things. I want to make sure you see that this is the square root of 4 minus x squared. These cannot be separated. This is not 2 minus x or something like that. Order of operations, when you're adding or subtracting under a radical, it's got to stay just like it is. So 4 minus x squared under the radical, that's as simple as that's going to get. But keep in mind we have that plus minus out front because we took the square root to get the y by itself. So now let's find a number if we substitute it in for x. 
I chose 1 again. So we've got 4 minus 1 squared, which gives us a 3 under the radical. So what do you notice here? When I substituted 1 in for the x, how many outputs did I get for y? Well, I got two outputs. I got a positive square root of 3 and a negative square root of 3. Can we have two outputs for one input if it's a function? No, we cannot. So this would not be a function. Quick shortcut way to do these, if you've got a y squared, it's not going to be a function. If you've got a y to the fourth, y to the sixth, any even power, it's not going to be a function because you're going to have this plus minus here when you try to solve for y. x can be squared, x can be cubed, it doesn't matter. And y can be raised to an odd power, you'd be okay. But if y is raised to an even power, it's not going to be a function because you're going to get this situation every time. Okay, another thing we're going to do quite a bit in this chapter is we're going to look at graphs. And so I want you to get good at reading a graph, knowing what the question's asking you to do. Half of this chapter is just really understanding what the questions want you to do. So let's, let's practice that here. We've got a graph, a generic graph of f of x, and they're asking us first to find the function values for f of negative 1 and f of positive 1. So remember what this means. This is function notation. They want you to look at the function value when x is negative 1. So I'm going to go to the graph, and I'm going to go to where x is negative 1. So remember, the x-axis is the horizontal axis. So negative 1 for the x value is here. I'm going to go up to the graph, to where it meets the graph, and I'm going to look at that point. The points in blue, I think, are just there for emphasis. But notice that that 1 uh, at x equals negative 1 has a y value of what? Hopefully you see that it's 2. So f of negative 1 is equal to 2. The ordered pair would be negative 1, comma, 2. How about for f of positive 1? We're going to go over here when x is 1, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go up to the graph, and the corresponding y va value there would be 4. So that ordered pair would be 1, comma, 4. So f of 1 equals 4. Domain, remember domain we said were all of the x values. A lot of times we're going to answer these in terms of interval notation. Remember interval notation from the end of chapter 1. So we're going to look at, if I want the domain, I'm going to look at the leftmost x value on the graph to the rightmost x value. So the leftmost x value here is negative 3. I think in this graph the white circle is meant to be an open circle, so that means we don't want to include negative 3. So think in interval notation how we would signify that. If we don't want to include the number, we would use a parenthesis. Here it is, negative 3 in parentheses. The rightmost x value we said was 6, and I think that blue means they do want us to include that. That's a filled-in circle, so we put a bracket around the 6. This other notation here you see is called set builder notation. You may see this in the homework questions. Um, I personally prefer interval notation. I think it's more useful, but set builder notation does come up once in a while in the homework. So if you see it, it's, it reads x such that is what that bar means x goes from negative 3, no underline there, just x is greater than negative 3, and less than or equal to positive 6. Now, for the range, the range are the y values, so we're going to look from the lowest y value to the highest y value on the graph. So the lowest y value right here would correspond to negative 4, and that's an open circle, so think about what that would look like in interval notation. And then the highest y value, if we go up, occurs at positive 4. And that's filled in. There's no, no hole or anything in the graph there, so that would be a bracket. Let's take a look. Here it is. So interval notation goes from negative 4 to positive 4, parentheses, and then bracket. And then set builder notation, notice they use a y this time because it's referring to the range. Last part of this PowerPoint, we're going to look at something called the vertical line test for functions. You may have seen this before. Um, it's a very easy test if you have the graph of a function or graph of a relation, I should say, and they ask you if that relation is a function. A quick way to do that is to draw a vertical line through the graph. You may have to check it in a few different places, but if at any of those locations you see that the vertical line hits the graph more than once, then it's not a function because each input would have or that particular input would have two outputs. Let's, let's take a look. So look at this, these four pictures here. They're asking you to use the vertical line test to decide which graphs are a function. So the first graph, we have an ellipse. So hopefully you see if we draw a vertical line at several places in the graph, it would intersect the graph twice. So that would not be a function.
Notice right here, it violates the defini definition of a function. This input, this x value, would correspond to two outputs. That's why the vertical line test works, so it's not a function. The second picture, we've got a diagonal line with a positive slope. And so if we draw a vertical line anywhere through it, it's only going to hit the graph once, so we are okay that is a function. Third picture, if we draw a vertical line anywhere through it, again, it's going to hit the graph only once, so it does not violate the definition of a function, so we're good to go there. The last picture, if we draw a vertical line through it in several places, again, hopefully you see that the vertical line hits the graph more than once, so then it would not be a function.